when you have a diverse board and a diverse management team who have different perspectives from their business experiences, and they're asking the right questions as the company is going through their decision process, that's where I see companies moving in the right direction. Welcome to the Innovation and Compliance Podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I'm thrilled to have with me Christina Prasani. Christina has a really interesting corporate advisory practice that touches on a wide variety of areas. And Christina, I am thrilled to have you on the pod and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. I'm thrilled to be here. Christina, could you tell us about your professional background? Sure, I'm happy to. I joined investment banking following my graduation from a liberal arts college called Wellesley, where I majored in economics and Spanish. And I decided that I wanted to find my way onto Wall Street to really bolster that liberal arts education and learn about how business works, how companies are valued, and really hone all of those quantitative skills that I didn't get in my liberal arts education. And once I got up that initial learning curve, I realized that I really liked what I did and I liked the people that I worked with, and here I am 25 years later, still on Wall Street. I joined right out of school, UBS, and I was there for about 20 years, and then I joined William Blair about five years ago, and I currently lead a team that focuses on advising public companies on all things mergers and acquisitions. So could you tell us a little bit about what William Blair is? And you've told us a little bit about your role there, but also more into your corporate advisory practice. William Blair is a private partnership that focuses on advising our clients. We have three separate business units, and I'm part of the investment banking unit. And I lead a team called the Corporate Advisory Team, which is a team focused on advising our public company clients. We started the team in December of 2019, and it really came about organically because when I was first hired to William Blair, I was actually hired to lead our financial services team, but I kept getting pulled in on all of these interesting public company assignments to help our clients think strategic questions that they were having. And so we looked at that and said, look, there's a need here from our clients. We should form a team specifically focused on giving our clients the kind of advice that they're needing. So we assembled a team by recruiting people both externally and internally. We're approximately 35 people now. And while we're relatively new, the people that we hired came from a lot of the big name bulge bracket firms like Goldman, Lazard, JP Morgan. And so you put everyone's experience together and it's pretty staggering, even though we're a brand new team from a formation perspective. Christina, I've been in the corporate world and have followed the role of boards of directors for 20 plus years. And I can't think of a more challenging time for boards and to be a board member. And to me, that challenge starts with the age old problem of how does the board provide meaningful oversight without managing? So how would you help a company's board think through that, that what I think is a basic issue, but is as important as it has ever been? We're helping our clients think through a lot of tough issues that they're facing right now. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a tough place out there to be a public company, given all of the market dislocation given the threats of a recession, given the leverage markets falling away from what they used to, there's a lot of change going on. And we're working with a lot of our clients to answer those questions and really help them figure out what strategic direction they want to take. And I think the boards that we work with, the best boards, they ask the hard questions. They don't micromanage their teams and they trust their teams, but 
they do their homework. And I love the board meetings where we have board member posing a lot of hard and thoughtful questions based on their experience and what they're seeing elsewhere in the market. Let me go to some of the either key themes for this year or next year that you're seeing, or maybe it's what are some of the key questions you and your team are getting. But I wanted to start with an introduction. I saw my daughter this week and who's 25 and kind of out of the blue, she asked me, why would a company ever buy another company when they didn't want to be bought? And I grew up in Boone Pickens era from the 80s. So I gave her a little tutorial on what that used to be like. But I wanted to use that as an introduction or are you seeing or are you seeing more unsolicited offers or perhaps other types of transactions that are on the increase? Or are those days really gone forever? We're actually seeing a lot of unsolicited offers. Now, the difference from the days that you're thinking of might be, they might be unsolicited, but they don't always end in hostile offers. Typically, they end up friendly. So about 85% of the transactions that we're seeing right now start with an unsolicited proposal. And so one of the things that we're working with most of our clients on right now is how are you prepared for that unsolicited proposal with valuations down and the future of a lot of companies somewhat uncertain? It's really important for management teams and boards to think through the question of, okay, what do I do if someone comes and puts an offer on the table? At what price do I have to engage? At what price can I just say, no, that doesn't make sense for our shareholders? And so We really work with our clients to figure out how to answer that proposal if it comes and really what the alternatives are. You need to know, if I don't do this, how am I going to create value for my shareholders? Is it through acquisitions? Is it through divestitures? Is it through just executing on my strategic plan? And so we help our clients think through all of those questions. Can I maybe flip that question because I'm always intrigued when an unsolicited offer is made, that a company can review publicly available information and see something that perhaps no one else saw, or they look at things in a different way and they see a value or a potential value. And so they make an unsolicited offer that may become a friendly offer or a friendly takeover. But do you advise companies who are actively engaging and just looking? So just to make sure I understand the question, you're asking, do we advise the companies who might be the buyers, who might be the people putting in those unsolicited proposals. Right. Yes. We work with all of our clients to evaluate acquisition and merger opportunities. And then if something is of interest to them, we help them think through how to best get engagement from the company that they're most interested in. And sometimes that include a strategy of registering your interest to an unsuspecting CEO or board member, but it's no one size fits all. I think there are always intertwined relationships between boards and companies. And the real goal is to get all the brains together in a room to figure out if a deal makes sense for both sets of shareholders, whether it's a cash deal or a stock deal. What we're doing when we're advising on the buy side is really trying to figure out how do we maximize the possibility of you getting a good outcome here. What are you seeing in the larger corporations in terms of prioritizing their portfolio optimization? We continue to work with a lot of our clients to evaluate whether they keep all of their various different businesses or think about potentially selling one or spinning one off. I think it really is situational specific. So it depends on where you are in terms of your market position in each particular division. It depends on what market valuations are and if you were to sell something, what you could sell it for. And then there's the question of, well, if you sell it, what do you do with that cash and how do you redeploy it to generate more value for your shareholders. And it doesn't always make sense to divest divisions, but it's something that we're really looking at with a lot of our clients to figure out, can we create more shareholder value if 
we are more focused and perhaps redeploy not only our time, but our money into places where we might be able to create more shareholder value. Over the past few years, I've seen a huge increase in the discussion around data and data analytics, the use of data analytics. So I now wanted to use that as a background to introduce the question of, are you seeing non-tech companies accelerate a focus on digitalization and is digitalization different than data analytics from your perspective? Yeah, I think digitalization is table stakes now and most of our clients, if they're not already doing it, are evaluating how to do it, whether they're doing it organically or they're going out and acquiring the capability. And so I really do think that every company need, is thinking about it and needs to be thinking about it to be able to achieve their goals and deliver good results for their shareholders. Where do you see these role in corporate governance and perhaps even the expansion of m and ESG has come to the forefront as a focus area for boards. And it's one of those things that I think is a must have. It's not a nice to have. And so ESG can take a lot of different forms. It can take the form of diversity. It can take the form of environmental. And I find boards are focused on it less so from a, how do we go out and acquire this capability? And more so, how do we make sure that we've got the right diverse set of perspectives from a management team? from a board perspective, and making sure that they've got the right people in place and the right people who are thinking about the issues in terms of informing their everyday decisions. We're not necessarily getting looped in on, we have an ESG problem, how do we acquire our way out of it? It's more they're thinking about it on a day-to-day basis and really making sure they have the right building blocks in place such that the people who are making the decisions are including ESG as part of their decision-making process. One of the reasons I find ESG so powerful is I see it as a business process and that as a business process, then you can measure it, manage it, and hopefully use it for greater efficiencies. And the other key thing for me is that ESG either forces or allows, I'm not quite sure which, someone or some group to have a much more holistic view of a lot of disparate and different aspects of corporations that had been previously engaged in, but siloed. Do you see that at the board level, that type of holistic oversight around ESG as well? I do, yes. As I hinted at before, where I'm seeing it is in those board discussions. So when you have a diverse board and a diverse management team who have different perspectives from their business experiences, and they're asking the right questions as the company is going through their decision process, that's where I see companies moving in the right direction. And so I do think it should and is becoming an important part of the decision-making process. And I think the first step in that, again, is having the right people around the table who are asking the right questions and focused on the right things. So the last drill general topic I'd like to raise with you is shareholder activism. And I practiced law in Houston for 40 years. So Exxon is always at the top of mind in Houston. And I can't think of a more public display of shareholder activism than they went through a couple of years ago. And I think it really opened everyone's eyes up that hopefully they were looking before. But when you're on the front page of the paper for shareholder activism, that gets everybody's attention. So I wanted to use that to ask you, what are you seeing around shareholder activism? Are you helping companies think through either responses or I guess responses is the right word? And to be prepared for that literally every May. Yes. I think we all saw a little bit of a pullback in activism through the pandemic and companies now have 10 quarters of results. So you can no longer really hide behind the pandemic numbers are you're out there. And so what we're seeing is an increase in activism. And even beyond publicly filed 13 Ds and the publicly acknowledged activism, there's a lot of activism going on behind the scenes. In fact, we were just talking to a client yesterday that just did a pipe 
they had activists circling around them right before they did the pipe who finally went away when they were able to execute the pipe with the quote unquote smart money. We've got a lot of clients who are worried about it, thinking about it, and we're helping them to prepare for how to handle an activist if someone comes forward. And I think, again, with valuations being depressed right now, activists are ripe to start being more proactive in terms of rattling people's cages. Along with the unsolicited approach, we are working with our clients to make sure they're prepared for activist approaches as well. I may have misspoke because I said you should think about it in May. Perhaps I should have asked, should you be thinking about it 12 months out of the year? And You really should, have- absolutely. And that's what we do with our clients. What I always say is for both unsolicited approaches and activist approaches, it's like having an umbrella. You want to carry it, you hope it doesn't rain and you hope you don't need it, but you've always got to have the umbrella so that when and if it does happen, you're ready and you can stay dry in the storm. Christina, are there any issues that you and your team have flagged down the road that you're starting to bring to board's attentions in 2025 or even beyond, or is it a continuation of some of the key themes you've picked up on in 2022? I really think it's a continuation and it's a constant evolution. Ultimately, what companies need to be thinking about is how to create shareholder value. That's always the number one thing on boards and CEOs' minds. And really trying to help our clients think through that, bringing to bear our sector expertise, our product expertise, like equity capital markets, leverage finance, mergers and acquisitions, really take all the tools in our tool chest and work with our clients to say, how do we create the most value? Is it through an acquisition? Is it through a divestiture? Is it through a merger? And I think we're going to continue to see that be the question at top of people's minds. And again, as tough market conditions prevail, there's also the cloud of what do I do if someone tries to make an opportunistic approach? And just helping our clients to be ready for that, I think, is something that will always be. Doing. Christina, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I was wondering. If our listeners wanted any more information on yourself or any of the topics you've touched on or to talk about your corporate advisory practice, what would be the best place for them to go? We've got a website. It's www.williamblair.com. And people can find me on that website, my team on that website, as well as a lot of really interesting research and literature that we put out just to help folks stay abreast of changing market conditions. Christina, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me, and I hope we can continue this conversation. Thank you for the time. It was a pleasure speaking with you. If you want to stay up to date on the latest innovations in compliance and help your business run more efficiently, subscribe to this podcast and help spread the word by leaving a review.